Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is Foul Play here, and uh, today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different and going through a guide to the deck. So, uh, without further ado, uh, this is my ultimate guide to Boggles. Uh, so, this is going to be broken up into a two part series. So, in the first part, which is here today, uh, we're going to go through, uh, you know, what is Boggles, uh, why you would play it, potential pros and cons, uh, examples of creatures, uh, auras, and removal. Uh, and land that you'll see in the main deck um, and then there's just going to be some uh, example deck uh, deck lists uh, some example sideboards next to those deck lists and uh, th there's going to be a few slides also with uh, sideboard cards and potentially why you might be uh, choosing to use those sideboard cards in part two I'm going to go through a detailed uh, breakdown on how to sideboard uh, for various matchups uh, and that's going to be coming out next weekend uh, so be sure to stay tuned if you'd like to see that one. All right, so the pros of playing the deck. So as far as it's concerned, uh, everything is concerned, pardon me. Uh, Magic is quite a complicated game, and the learning curve is quite steep for a lot of new players. Um, and Boggles, uh, being a little bit of an uninteractive deck in a lot of respects... <clears throat> oh, pardon me. In a lot of respects, it's a bit of an uninteractive deck, and uh, it, it makes it easier to learn with. Um, just learning what you're doing without having to worry about what your opponent is doing. Um, other than that, it can be a lot of fun uh, beating down people with a giant Baneslayer Angel, you know, like a 11-11 Flying Lifelink Vigilance monster. Um, and yeah, pretty pretty fun smacking people in the face with a creature they can't deal with. Um, so, other than that, the creature-based matchups and things like burn matchups are normally favoured towards us. Uh, we have a really strong selection of sideboard cards, which help us uh, to deal with what other decks are doing. Um, and other than that, uh, just, uh, contrary to popular belief, the deck does actually scale with your skill level, uh, despite people calling it a no-skill deck. Um, as I think I've shown in a lot of my different videos. Um, okay, so as far as cons of the deck are concerned, so it's weak to combo decks. Um, other than that, there are a lot of we lose cards, uh, i.e. Ugin, uh, the Spirit Dragon, All is Dust, Liliana of the Veil, Engineered Explosives, Blast Zone, uh, just to name a few. Um, and once those we lose cards get played, we just sit there losing slowly, and it's it's pretty agonizing not being able to do anything in those situations. Um, other than that, a lot of our bad matchups actually have better sideboard interaction for us than what we do with them. And in addition to that, us sideboarding uh, disrupts our synergy more than them sideboarding for us disrupts their synergy, if that makes sense. So... Um, when we look to interact with our opponent's post board, uh, our deck hurts more from the disruption and synergy than our opponent's decks do. Uh, mostly because our deck is just so synergistic and you need to throw as many auras on the creature as possible to kill your opponent as quickly as possible. As soon as you start taking some of those cards out, um, there's less density of threats and your clock gets slowed down a lot. Um, in addition to that, uh, the deck is frustratingly inconsistent, um, where you might, might just mull down to oblivion because you're not seeing a creature, you're not seeing a land, um, you're not seeing auras, whatever it might be. We are a combo deck in a sense that we need the right combination of cards in our opening hand um, to actually play the game. Uh, but, you know, obviously we're not a proper combo deck, it's just uh, similar to Infect, really. Um, other than that... Uh, People really don't like playing against Bogles. Uh, they'll hate on you a fair bit, and it might be get a little bit tiring hearing it all uh, from them. But you know, uh, let, there is a lot more unfair stuff happening in modern than what we're doing with our little hexproof creatures. Um, look at Amulet Titan. Look at all the decks that were abusing like Lurus and Misha's Bobble when all of that was going on. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of crazier stuff that's happening than us so if people have an issue with bogles um i think they're directing their energy the wrong way really okay so as far as the main deck construction is concerned 
Um, usually you have 12 creatures. Um, occasionally you could go up to more if you don't like mulliganing. I think that's probably incorrect these days though. Um, especially considering we have the London mulligan rule now where you don't necessarily, like you always mull, you always see seven cards when you mulligan. Um, but you just choose which card goes on the bottom, which is pretty good for us. Aura-wise, you're going to be looking to run 22 to 28 auras, uh, 20 lands, and then the utility slot slash removal slot is 0 to 6 cards. Um, and if you go anything over 6, you start like being way too light on auras and not being able to hit them when you need to. Alright, so the creatures I would consider um, playable in the deck... Uh, our one drop creatures, which are superstars in the Hexproof Scout and Hexproof Bogle. Uh, the two drop Core Spirit Dancer, which is a very big MVP, and it's a creature which is really underrated a lot um, by a lot of new players that come to the deck. They more focus on the times where Core will lose them games than when the games that like Core wins them. Um, and Silhana Lodge Walker, which is another two-drop creature, and it has Hexproof, which is very appealing. It also has Evasiveness. It can only be blocked by flying creatures. Um, and in the Mirror Match, uh, that actually gets around Spider Umbra, um, giving block... <laughs> like, it's Spider Umbra, which allows them to block creatures with flying. This isn't worded as flying, so Spider Umbra um, will not let an opponent block a Ledge Walker, which is pretty interesting. Um... The other notable inclusion would be Basara, uh, but that's double green, um, as opposed to green and one. And when you're talking about getting double white and double green by turn two, you're potentially talking about fetching and shocking yourself for six points of damage, um, at which point you're opening yourself up to a lot of inconsistencies. I also th think since the London Mullingar rule was made a thing, um, we have a lot less reason to uh, be putting our weight on Silhana Ledge Walker. Uh, seems we can just, you know, mulling into six, mulling into five, and find our one drops quite, quite easily. Okay, so as far as the auras are concerned, um, these are the auras uh, that I consider main deck playable, or have been main deck playable in the past. Um, so you'll see here, Cartouche of Solidarity, Ethereal Armor, Grist Moon, Hyena Umbra, Sentinel's Eyes, Spirit Link, Keen Sense, Rancor, Spider Umbra, all the glitters, uh, Luminarf Mantle, Sentinel's Eyes, Spirit Mantle, Daybreak Coronet, Cetacean Training, and Unflinching Courage. Now, a lot of these I wouldn't be playing in my deck at the moment, and I think they're metagame, um, metagame considerate, uh, whatever I want to say. Um, my brain's not quite working there. It's metagame dependent, there we go. Alright, so Luminarf Mantle, for example, um, didn't really see a lot of play for a lot of people playing this deck, and I think it's gotten to the stage now where the aura is actually a little outdated and probably doesn't deserve to be on the list. Sort of an honourable mention, as is uh, Satessan Training, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, but yeah, so basically the really good thing about uh, Lunark Mantle, sorry, I think I pronounced that wrong before, is that for two mana, it gives you 2-2, two -two, and it has a potential uptick where you can suck the... Loom, Lunark Mantle to give uh, the creature flying until end of turn. So, as far as like the hate bear scale on the aura is concerned, like you'll see with Hyena Umbra with Sentinel's Eyes, Spider Umbra, they all give one one for one mana. So, the fact that you're investing two mana and you're still getting like one stat for each of those manas, um, it's, it's pretty relevant in, in terms of deck construction and in terms of actually hitting your opponent quickly and for a decent amount of damage. Um, but I will say something like all the glitters which came out recently is a much more powerful effect um, <laughs> than what Lunark Mantle is. So I don't think you'll see much play from Lunark Mantle anymore. Uh, so Tessin Training, I'll just jump over that one quickly as well. Um, I don't think it is currently good in Bogles. I don't think... Um, it has had a good metagame to be played in yet. If there's like a removal heavy uh, metagame, like with Jund or something, where they're attacking your enchantments, I see like just the fact that when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, like it replaces itself. 
I think in an attrition war, it could potentially be useful. I just haven't seen a time to utilize it yet. Um, other than that, uh, probably the only other wacky aura I have on here uh, would be Sentinel's Mark. So this is actually a flash speed aura. So you can play this at instant speed during combat, during your opponent's turn. It costs two mana, it gives you one uh, power, two toughness, and it also gives you creature vigilance. Uh, the other added benefit is if you cast it during your main phase, you'll get lifelink until end of turn. Um, so it's like pseudo pseudo lifelink, kind of. You get lifelink for a single turn. Um, which might not sound like much, but the fact it gives you that option makes the like It does up the power level of the card a fair bit. Um, the main advantage to a card like Sentinel's Mark is if you're versing a metagame with lots of ensnaring bridge, um, you can actually attack with a zero power core spirit dancer and then pop down Sentinel's Mark at instant speed. Uh, at which point, excuse me, at which point you'll be able to get three points of damage through to your opponent. Um, but usually uh, the issue with that is your opponent might have more than three life or they might have a chump blocker and they're just going to chump block because why wouldn't they chump block a zero power creature? Um, like, we have no real way to give our core evasiveness uh, to enable those last three points of damage through, which kind of stinks a little bit. Okay, so... Um... For most people that have seen my videos, um, I play a lot with a lot of these different auras here. So Ethereal Armor is arguably the most important aura in your deck. It gives 1-1 one, one, uh, for each creature you control and also gives your creature first strike. Hyena Umbra gives 1-1 one, one in first strike, so it doesn't grow for every aura you control, but it does have the important wording of Totem Armor, which your Spider Umbra does as well which uh, activates as a replacement effect for destroy effects on your creature. And instead of losing your creature and all the auras attached to it, this aura just falls off instead. Um, of course, if they're doing something like Engineered Explosives or Blast Zone on 1, it will make all the other auras fall off as well. Uh, but there's not too much you can do about that. Uh, just the fact you keep your creature basically gains you two turns, really. Um, okay. So the other superstar in the main deck uh, that everyone always plays is Four of Rancor. Uh, so it gives uh, plus two power, zero toughness, and trample. And when Rancor is put into the gra uh, battlefield from the graveyard, it's returned to your hand. So there's two reasons why this card is important. Um, the first reason is trample is a good way to push damage over the top of chump blockers. Um, and it will make it difficult for your opponent uh, to slow you down if when they block with a creature uh, they still take damage. Um, <laughs> so tempo wise it's a very important card to have out. Uh, the second thing is when it goes to your graveyard from the battlefield it's returned to your hand. Now why is that important? So cards like uh, Engineered Explosives, Blast Zone that make all your auras fall off. Um, something like uh, Supreme Verdict, which will dump your creature to the bin, the aura comes back. So, it's really important because it comes back to your hand, and instead of losing all the auras on your creature, uh, you get something back, so you have something to rebuild with. Other than that, it's also ahead of the uh, mana power scale, giving two power for just one mana, which is very, very important. Um... Okay, so the next card similar to Rancor would probably be Grisboom. So it gives evasiveness via flying. Uh, this is like pseudo evasiveness because you push damage over the top. Um, evasiveness of flying is pretty important. Um, so for one, one mana, it gives you one power, zero toughness, and flying. And uh, for four mana, you can return it from your graveyard to the battlefield and attach it onto a creature you control. Um, so that's pretty important. Um, firstly, it's important just to fly over the top of lots of things. In matchups like Death Shadow, it's going to be really, really important to actually fly over the top. Um, and in other matchups, uh, like Eldrazi Trom, you can actually, uh,
put this into your graveyard uh, through Chalice of the Void, um, and then you can, for four mana, react activate this, get it back onto your creature, get past that Chalice of the Void on one, play your Daybreak Coronet through hand on in your hand, and then start attacking with like a five power flying Vigilance creature with lifelink, and it just shores that match up up a lot. Um, as long as they're not a super aggressive like don't have a super aggressive thing like turn two chalice turn three thought not turn uh four reality smasher turn five reality smasher like there's going to be some hands which are going to be very difficult to beat uh but it shores up enough that uh it, it's notable the activated ability there so sentinel's eyes uh has been the newest addition to our deck um i've been really enjoying it as a two of I did play test it as a three of for a little while, and I felt like I ran into it a little bit too much. Um, the issue I have with Sentinel's Eyes is it doesn't give like it, although it gives one one and vigilance, which are the really good stats. It doesn't give first strike, and it has a decent amount of main deck dissynergy with both Rancor and Grispoon. Uh, more so Rancor though. Um, so if your opponent puts down like a, a four five Tarmogoyf, and you've got Sentinel's Eyes and Rancor on your creature, you've got like a 4-2 hexproof creature with Vigilance and Rancor, and you can't attack. Or even if he's just dropped a 3-3 three, three creature, you can't attack. Or just a 2-power creature, you can't attack. Like, it's it's pretty awkward. Um, it's like that a little bit with Grispoon, mostly because uh, Ice Fang Cottle exists, and it's a 1-1 one, one Flyer Death Toucher, as long as they control three other Snow Permanents, which the deck can reasonably reliably do by turn two um through turn one arkham's astrolabe plus double snowland and then they've got their death touch live which is a little bit frustrating but normally they hit um hit it by turn three instead of turn two okay uh so any auras that i've missed out here well, obviously daybreak coroner is a very very important aura here um so for two mana uh, this is often like our superstar aura that just wins us the game. So for 2 mana, it gives you 3-3, three, three, First Strike, Vigilance, and Lifelink, which is a lot. Uh, it does actually have a downside, though. So it can only enchant creature which has already has an aura attached to it. Um, and other than that, uh, if, if I've got Daybreak down on a creature with another aura, let's say Hyena Umbra, and they destroy the Hyena Umbra, because the creature is no longer enchanted by a different enchantment, Daybreak Coronet will actually fool the graveyard, which is a pretty frustrating weakness. Um, other than that, the last card that I... Uh, the last two cards I haven't gone over. Uh, Spirit Mantle. Really, really powerful um, aura. One, I'm, I, I am going to be testing back in... I've been running four Griff Spoon and like zero Spirit Mantle, but I'm going to be testing two Griff Spoon, two Spirit Mantle for... A few leagues coming up up soon. Um, it's just a way, way more powerful effect than Grispoon. It's one mana less efficient, which is relevant. Um, but the effect being really powerful uh, is perhaps more relevant. In matchups like Humans or Spirits, not that spir Spirits is around much at the moment, um, it can actually stop things like Reflector Mage or Deputy of Detention from bouncing your core Spirit Dancer. Um, they can they can exile the Spirit Mantle or destroy it with a Knight of Autumn, exile it with Deputy of Detention, and then bounce your core Spirit Dancer. But it's an added layer of protection um, before they're actually able to do that. Um, and other than that, if you don't have Rancor to push damage through and your opponent's putting a whole bunch of flying blockers up, like Lingering Souls tokens or something, um, then obviously Spirit Mantle is just the more powerful evasive effect because they can't block at all. Uh, Unflinching Courage, uh, Honorable Mention, has been played as a uh, one of or a two of historically. I don't really play it at the moment. Added benefits are uh, it gives a good... Uh, number of stats um, It gives you both trample and lifelink So it's almost like having a fifth rancor and a fifth daybreak coronet just at three mana instead But they're combined together so you get both stats So obviously if you don't have daybreak you don't have rancor you just have a whole bunch of umbras you have this big seven power creature that can attack but You're just getting chump blocked out all of a sudden 
you've got your lifelink, you've got your trample, both are in the one card. It's really strong. And I think I just uh, forgot to mention either Spirit Link and Keen Sense. So, uh, Keen Sense doesn't add any stats. Uh, hasn't been played that much competitively um, as of recent times. But when you deal damage to your opponent, you may draw a card, which you almost always do uh, draw off of that ability. And that's really good against attrition based decks, sort of like Satessum Training. Um, but it doesn't add any stats, although it is a mana cheaper. Spirit Link is really good against things like Burn, and actually if you put it on a creature like Eidolon of the Great Rebel, every time uh, you take damage from Eidolon, it then triggers and you gain that life back. So that's a pretty cool secondary feature. Other than that, um, its life gain does not... It, its life gain stacks with the life link on Daybreak Coroner or Unflinching Courage, meaning you can gain two lots of life in one attack or one block. And if you have multiple spirit links on the one creature, you actually gain multiple instances of its its life gain trigger, um, which I found out it's one of my opponents that actually played two of these in the main deck. Um, okay, so that's it for the auras there, which was quite intense. Uh, quite a mouthful. Have a pause, have a drink if you need to. We're going to continue on to the lamb. All right, so this is the typical land base up here that I'm going for at the moment. Um... Temple Garden, I'm running as a 3 of. Razor Verge Thicket as a 4 of. Rising Canopy as a 4 of. I've then got 5 fetch lands between Windswept Heath and Misty Rainforest. You want green fetch lands because they can search out your Forest Dryad here. Uh, so if you don't have a creature or your creature dies, you can use a fetch land to get out a new creature via Dryad Arbor. And you can also play around Liliana of the Veil. Um by keeping up an open fetch land and getting Dried Arbor and sacking that in response. Um, now you do want four Windswept Teeth um, because they will search out both your forest and your plains and there's going to be Blood Moon matchups where you're going to want that plains or a Burn matchup where you're going to want to save life and not shock in a Temple Garden. Um, so yeah, very, very important. So, uh, other than that, um, Sometimes uh, a lot of people coming into Magic don't have a lot of money or they don't want to spend a lot of money. Um, so some budget options for land uh, for the deck include Sun Petal Grove and Brushland. Uh, I guess you could also do Mana Confluence in City of Brass, although you potentially take a lot more damage off them. Um, so Sun Petal Grove, for those of you that don't know, will enter the battlefield tapped unless you control a forest or a plains. So obviously you've got a plains here, you've got a forest here. And on your Temple Garden, it also ha actually has the key wording of Forest and Plains here. So any of these lands here will enable some Petal Grove to come in untapped. I guess Dried Arbor will too. Uh, Brushed Land will always come into play untapped. Uh, it can tap for one colorless mana without dealing you damage. Or if you want to tap it for green or white, it will deal one damage for you uh, to you. <sighs> but yeah, that's... Uh, that's pretty much it for the land options. As I said, you can put some uh, cheaper options in there if a budget is an issue to you. Uh, if you're not able to afford the fetch lands here, and you've replaced them with brush lands, I probably wouldn't bother putting the dried arbor in until you get access to the fetch lands. Um, because it's not a very important land to have on the deck if you can't reliably search for it. Okay, so, uh, moving on to the utility slot. So these are cards that I sort of um, consider you can use them in the main deck. They're not removal, um, but you can put them in the main deck for a certain metagame, for a certain purpose. And there's actually uh, one card that I didn't lead, uh, include on here, which is Leyline of the Void as well. Um, but yeah, so Leyline of Sanctity, if you've been playing the deck for a while, or following me for a while, it's by far the most used one. Um, so if it's in your opening hand, you as a player have Hexproof, so your opponent can't point damage spells at your face, um, and they can't make you discard cards by targeting you. Um, very powerful effect, stops us from having our creatures sacrifice to Luliana as well. Really, really solid card. Um, if you 
intending to play sort of competitively or semi-competitively, I highly recommend including this in your list as a three to four of. Uh, suppression field, it doesn't have to be in your main deck either. It can be in your sideboard. Um, yeah. So suppression field is a card a lot of opponents will forget about or forget it exists or be surprised that you're boarding in against them. Um, so this card for two mana comes down makes activated abilities cost two more to activate unless they're mana abilities. So this is really important. Um, so uh, Planeswalkers, their activated abilities will cost two more to activate. Fetch lands, fetching a land from the deck will cost two more power to activate. Um, and there's some activated abilities on creatures like Dried Arbor where it says untap target land, that will cost two more to activate. Um, Devoted Druid, its untap ability, uh, will cost two more mana to activate. So there's a large amount of utility where Suppression Field is very, very important. Kiki Jiki or Splinter Twin Combo, those sorts of things. All of that. Um, now, it does have dissynergy with your own fetch lands. I'm currently only running five fetch lands. Um, a little bit because of this, but a little bit because Dried Arb is just not that good at the moment for us. Um, so other than that, I've included some Graveyard Hate pieces here. Obviously, uh, graveyard decks are not uh, an issue at the moment, in my opinion. Um, they have been in the past, like in Hogak season, uh, where people were running around with this really broken Hogak deck, which would dump a million cards in the graveyard, and they'd just hit their comboing off for 5 or 10 minutes, and then eventually kill you with a massive, massive board state. Um, or I think it just shot you for damage as well. There are a few variations of the deck. But yeah. Uh, you've got access to Relic, Surgical Extraction, and Leyline of the Void, all of which you can you include in your main deck. Uh, obviously, uh, Leyline of the Void's probably the most powerful effect, in my opinion. It only exiles your opponent's graveyards. Um, it won't exile your own. And it won't cost you any mana to put down on the field either, like your own Leyline. Uh, you wouldn't ever be able to cast it with your mana base, but... That's not why you'd be running it. You'd be running it to see it in your open hand. Um, Relic of Progenitus has the added benefit of replacing itself when you do the exile. That means in uh, matchups where their graveyard doesn't matter, uh, you can just get rid of the card, the hate piece. It replaces itself, and you don't need to worry anymore. So that's particularly important against um, decks like... Um, it's not particularly... It, it's, it's important not to disadvantage yourself card-wise against decks that don't need it. Like, Graveyard Hate has a, its place against things like Storm or, or Dredge, um, and even uh, your Bank Control decks or anything running Mystic Sanctuary. Um, it's pretty important, and I can see it as a main deck uh, includable Graveyard Hate piece just because it does have the option to just sacrifice it and draw a card. Um... Yeah, and Surgical Extraction also gets included in that list because it also costs uh, zero mana to cast, um, much like Leyline of the Void. Um, but it will cost you two life, not a huge issue. And in, like, dead matchups, they might put something in their graveyard. Like, imagine against a back control deck, um, they go ahead and cast Uro, and then once Uro's in the graveyard, you just exile all the copies out of their de deck, or your opponent activates uh, a fetch land, gets Mystic Sanctuary, Mystic Sanctuary's trigger goes on the stack, targets Cryptic Command, Anger of the Gods, Supreme Verdict, whatever it might be. You can then exile all copies of their uh, that card from their hand and their deck in response, and also get information about what's in their deck and what you may or may not need to play around. All right. So, removal spells. So, I've got some funky ones in here. Uh, some of you might have seen these before. Others, uh, probably not. Uh, hold on. Just getting my picture out of the way for now. Alright. So, uh, Path to Exile. Everyone should be familiar with this spell. It's a really powerful effect. Uh, it's an exile effect. Um, it's instant speed. It only costs one mana. Downside is your opponent gets a basic land out of it and that comes into play under their uh, control tapped. Now, Savage Swipe is a card I've been using a little bit recently. Um, I think it's been really good in certain matchups and certain situations. It's 
major downside is its sorcery speed. Um, and also it's a fight mechanic. So if your opponent's got something like Soul Scarab Mage out, um, it's not combat damage, it's like fight damage. So it's something different. And I think it actually adds neg counters onto your creature unless you have something like Spirit Mantle down. Um, but the major advantage to this is turn one, you play your creature. Turn two, you play a one power aura. Plus Savage Swipe, deal with your opponent's creature. Now that creature uh, could be a Noble Hierarch. It could be an Arbor Elf. Uh, it could be um, a Thing in the Ice, something like that. You kill that creature, you get to attack for four now. Your creature will shrink down to two in the next turn. But you've got to, like, essentially destructive revelry a creature for one mana. Um, which is pretty impressive. Um, but it also has the downside. If your creature is smaller than your opponent's creature, it's not going to work as a removal spell. Um, unless it's got two power. Uh, now, Dismember, I think is a pretty funky one. Uh, it only costs one mana. It can be cast through things like Blood Moon. Um, the downside being it will cost you four life to cast. Um, and you're probably limited to the number you can actually play in the deck, uh, just from how much life it will cost you, and you might actually want to consider including more than the four Daybreak Coronets for life gain, so some Spirit Links or some Unflinching Courages if, if you're heavy on this card, just to make sure you don't kill yourself. Now, the last inclusion is Gelid Shackles, and <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people have not seen this card before. I absolutely love this card. Um, somehow I don't actually own any copies in foil. I think I have like eight copies of the card and none of them are in foil. Um, but for one white mana, uh, you can enchant their creature. The creature can't block and it's activated. The abilities can't activate. Uh, other than that, you can pay one snow mana, which would be a basic land, which you can search out to make the creature a defender and hence it won't be able to attack each turn. So... So if you hold one mana up each turn, that creature is not going to be able to attack either. So why is this important? Um, so it's important because a card called Spell Sky exists, and it it um, steals all our auras for two life. Uh, so if you put this down on Spell Sky, it will stop that from happening. Um, and Spell Sky's not been like a hugely prominent thing as of recent times, with the exception of the uh, Court of Calling, Collected Company, Combo Deck thing that's running around. Um, other than that, no one really plays Spell Sky, um, and doesn't really need to be on your radar, uh, but maybe it's something to keep up your sleeve in case the metagame ever changes. So, just a moment, I'm just going to have another drink. Alright, so moving on to Graveyard Hate Pieces. So I've mentioned three of these before. Um, most people would have seen Rest in Peace. Uh, it exiles all graveyards, including your own, and it stops cards from being put into the graveyard and automatically exiles them instead. Um, its downside is it affects both graveyard, graveyards, so it has a dissynergy with our Rancor and our Griff Spoon and our Sentinel's Eyes, pardon me. Um, it costs two mana, and... Yeah, that, that's about it, but it's a really strong effect, and I think a really important one, and an important card to have. Uh, so, our next hate piece uh, is Graph Digger's Cage, so one mana, it's colourless generic mana, so uh, it doesn't matter um, what, what land you use to play it, you can use it. Uh, so it will, uh, creatures can't enter the battlefield from graveyards and libraries. Uh, and players can't cast spells from graveyards or libraries. So this has extra utility um, than Rest in Peace. So things like Court of Calling, Collected Company, um, Neoform, Eldritch Evolution. They won't be able to get creatures into play uh, against the Graft Digger's Cage. Also, it's one mana cheaper. So against something like Grishel Shell, which I first the other day, um, you can get it out a turn earlier and then against a deck that could potentially win on turn 2 or turn 3, just mana efficiency can be important. Um, it does, however, have the dissynergy of stopping us from searching out Dryad Arbor, 
So if you need to search out Dryad Arbor, be sure to search it out before you uh, play this. And unfortunately, if you try to play Dryad Arbor through this, it will remain in your library. And you won't get any land, and you'll just strip mine yourself. Alright, so been over these two. The last card that we... or these three. Uh, the last card we haven't touched base on is Fairy Makaiba. Um, now this, this card actually gets a lot of play in Legacy. Um, even though you don't see it very often in Modern. Still a really powerful effect. So you just discard it from your hand. And you get to exile up to two cards from the graveyard. Now why is this important? Because it's uncounterable. Your opponent cannot play a counter spell into this and stop you from doing it. It's instant speed. It doesn't cost you any mana. It's all really powerful. And it also hits two cards. So if your opponent's uh, heavily hinged around their graveyard or a couple of cards in their graveyard, it's pretty important. It's, it's a pretty powerful effect to have. It does have dissynergy uh, with Suppression Field, though. Uh, so if you're playing Suppression Field, um, maybe use a different graveyard hate pace. Um, it's also good against, you know, Mystic Sanctuary and Snapcaster Mage targets, and your opponents like to play, play mana efficiently and on curve, and a zero mana, like, destroy their graveyard spell is going to come uh, unexpected to them. Alright, so, Artifact and Enchantment hate now. Alright, uh, so, as far as straight Artifact hate is concerned, We've got Stony Silence here, which just is a two-mana enchantment, reads activated abilities and artifacts can't be activated. We've got Collector Roof here, uh, which is again two-mana, green instead of white though, and again reads activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. This is however a creature with a 2-2 body, uh, which can, can be better or worse depending on what you're versing. So if you're versing something like Tron, um, and you're on the play. It's only really good on the play against Tron. It's not that good on the draw. Same with Stony Silence. Um, but you can turn to cast a Collector Roof or a Stony Silence. Locks them off their land and you attack. So the benefit of playing Collector Roof against Tron is they will be siding in Nature's Claim against us. And if they happen to have Basic Forest in their hand or they draw into it, they can Nature's Claim to kill the Stony Silence and then continue to activate their artifacts, build their Tron lands and go from there where Collector Roof uh, is resilient against that. Uh, conversely though, if they're packing creature hate like Dismember or Spatial Contortion, um, Lightning Bolt, Galvanic Blast, whatever it might be, uh, Collector Roof is way, way more frail. Um, <coughs> sorry guys, I've got a bit of a cold and my sinuses are all blocked up. Um, so, moving on to the uh, next two spells. So we've got Creeping Corrosion here, which does get a lot of play because it's quite costly at 4 mana, but it destroys all artifacts. And when decks like Affinity, um, and, uh, what was it called? There was another artifact combo deck, I can't remember. Used its own graveyard and got really big and spent a long time comboing off. Um, when those artifact heavy decks are in play, you get to destroy all their artifacts, which messes them up pretty hard. Downside is it's sorcery speed, but I guess all these uh, top artifact only cards are sorcery speed. Um, and Consulate Crackdown. So Consulate Crackdown was actually a sideboard card for pretty specifically Lantern Control. Um, because I'd get out multiple ensnaring bridges and multiple um, Chalice of the Void. And you'd be able to just take them all down just with one aura and wipe away that all of their mill effects, their land and everything, you could just get rid of it all in one go. Um, and it only affects your opponent as well. But it's also quite costly at 5 mana, um, which is its downside. So other than that, we have Artifact en Enchantment Hate um, that targets both. So Nature's Claim, 1 mana instant, destroys target Artifact and Enchantment. Uh, that player whose Artifact or Enchantment you destroyed will gain full life. Um, so you, most of the time your opponent's going to be gaining full life. If you're versing a burn deck or something though, though, you could potentially sideboard Nature's Claim in against burn. Um, use it on your own aura. Uh, you could use it on a Rancor. Your Rancor goes to the graveyard. You gain full life. You replay Rancor. Um, and then you win the exchange and you don't lose any resources out of it. It just costs you two mana. Two mana, full life against burn. Not bad. Other than that, it could hit their uh, Eidolon, you know. Alright, uh, so moving on, natural state, 
Uh, they won't gain life from natural state, but it can only target artifacts or enchanted with enchantments with CMC three or less. Um, Seal of Prim Primordium is potentially uh, the most played artifact or enchantment effect before Force of Vigor came out. It costs two mana, which is more expensive, but you can put it out of your hand onto the battlefield, um, which will let your opponent know about it. But then once it's on the battlefield, you can just start tapping out all of your mana um, and your opponent, uh, you don't slow down your tempo. Like you only slow your tempo down for one turn. Um, and, and you know, that's all. Um, and then you can be aggressive like you'd normally be. Now, Unravel the Aether, I can't see it getting much play at the moment. It doesn't destroy, it shuffles uh, into its owner's library. Um, the benefit to Unravel the Aether is if your opponent's playing a regenerative effect like Welding Jar, um, it will get around that regenerative effect. Now, Quiet Disrepair, um, this is more of an honorable mention than a playable card, um, but it's actually an enchantment aura. So when you cast it, you'll get a draw off your Core Spirit Dancer. Um, you can also tutor it uh, with Open the Armory into your hand, and for two mana, you get to enchant an artifact or an enchantment. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you destroy the enchanted permanent or gain two life. So it's got a little bit of versatility, and it can destroy. Its downside is it doesn't destroy instantly, um, and your opponent has a chance to answer it before it even does anything. <coughs> so last but not least, Force of Vigor. The card I play more than any other card in this slot. So four mana, but you can exile a green card from your hand instead of paying its mana cost. You get to destroy two artifacts or enchantments. The really good thing about this card is a lot of decks where we really, really need this, they quite often have multiple artifacts out, and getting to hit two of them is more important than hitting one. Like, if they've got two ensnaring bridges out, it's like, oh yay, I've destroyed one, but now I can't deal with the other one, where with Force of Vigor you get to hit two things, and it's much, much more valuable. Alright, so, Stormhate. I've made a dedicated Stormhate page here. Uh, I'll just disappear the camera again. Alright, should really have had it in this top corner over here, but uh, a little late now. So, Rest in Peace exiles their graveyard. Graveyards are important to Storm. Graft Digger's Cage stops them from casting cards in their graveyard. Um... Deafening Silence will mean they can only cast uh, one non-creature spell a turn. Uh, Damping Sphere will mean each spell they cast, cast after the first one will cost one generic mana extra. Uh, you also want your Leyline of Sanctities to protect you from being grape shotted. And Ether Sworn Canonist is uh, pretty similar to Deafening Silence, only it costs two mana, but it does give you a creature which can be handy, although they can just bounce the creature and then you lose all of that. Um, now obviously you don't want to bring in all these cards at once against Storm. These are just various cards in your repertoire that you can uh, configure into your sideboard and things you'll look to bring in. So normally you want your ley lines and then you might want two to four graveyard hate pieces and if you don't have two to four you can overlap it with something like Deafening Silence or Dampening Sphere. Uh, this has da Deafening Silence has synergy against Burn as well and Dampening Sphere has synergy against Tron, so, you know, they both have versatility and flex in your sideboard. <sighs> Alright, so, now, we have got the anti and to the battlefield effects. So, these are the three cards you'd be looking at playing, uh, all of which cost two mana. So, my favourite one to play is actually Torpor Orb here. Um, much, much like the Collector Roof and Stony Silence uh, thing before, it is difficult for your opponent to destroy unless they're running artifact and enchantment destruction um, where a lightning bolt, a fatal push, a path to exile cards that our opponents do leave in against us or sideboard in against us to deal with core spirit dancer. It is important they don't just sideboard out removal because they see hexproof creatures they will leave in removal or if they have dead cards um, like they have dead sideboard slots against you and they don't have anything to bring in. They're like, oh, well, I might as well leave this in anyway. Um, so it's an important thing to consider. If you're running a lot of things like Totem Armor, of course, like six six to eight Totem Armor effects or something, then these cards value, come like the creature value goes up a lot higher than the orbs value does. Um, but something to be uh, aware of. 
So I think probably the most powerful effect uh, is on Hushbringer here, which is the most recent addition to this package that we've received. So creatures entering the battlefield or dying don't cause abilities to trigger. So the fact it says or dying don't cause ability to, to trigger, um, it, it means things like matter reshaper won't cause your opponent to trigger a card out onto the battlefield. Um, and I don't know, it sort of has dis-synergy as well. Um, maybe you're versing that Urgmoth wheel combo deck with the uh, Young Wolf and the Jarus Messenger and Urgmoth and they're comboing off via damaging you and dying won't cause it to trigger. I guess the ETB doesn't, yeah. I don't know, that, that last line doesn't mean much to me, I guess. I'm not sure, but it might have dis-synergy with your totem armor as well. Um, I think I did look it up a while ago, but I forget the uh, outcome of that. So the good thing about Hushbringer, though, is it's got flying and lifelink. Um, the bad thing is its power and toughness are only 1 and 2. So the reason why you choose Takatli over Hushbringer is Takatli plus 1 aura gives 4 toughness, um, and that might get around things like Lightning Bolt. Um, or Anger of the Gods, or whatever. It might be relevant to you, it might not. Uh, but just something to keep in mind is that point of toughness is is or could be relevant. <coughs> Alright, so just going through a few standard lists here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, God, <laughs> my sinuses are really being frustrating here. So we've got 20 land here. We've got the land base I showed you before. With the five fetches and etc. etc. Um, so this is actually the list I'm going to be testing in my next league. I'm not sure if I'll be including the Hushbringers or a different sideboard card. The sideboards are less relevant than the main deck here. So you've got your Ethereal Armor, uh, Hard Hitting Aura. You've got the two of Griftburn, uh, the four of Path to Exiles. Uh, Okay, on this one I moved uh, Leyline to the sideboard. This isn't quite the list I'm looking at running. Um, so four path to exiles, deal with your opponent's creature. Um, I don't think I really like running four path to exiles in the main deck, but if they ever unban Splinter Twin, it's probably going to be quite an important thing to consider. Um, you got your two Sentinel's Eyes, that's the number I like it at. So Grisburn, probably between two and four. Uh, Spirit Mantle, uh, between zero and three. Spider Umbra between 0 and 2. Uh, you've got your Rancors as well, your Daybreaks. All of that good stuff. Um, so if you want to destroy people's creatures with Path to Exile, that's probably the list for you. Uh, if you want more resilience against burn and uh, discard effects, then you might want to swap those ley lines in for these paths here. Alright. So. Uh, my current main deck, only 2 drop aura... The only two drop aura is Daybreak Coronet. So currently what I'm doing is I'm mucking around with Savage Swipe and a whole bunch of one drop auras. Uh, just so I can maximize the power of Savage Swipe. Um, only Dissynergy is really Rancor, giving two power instead of one. Um, but I still think the uptick of Savage Swipe is high enough to just trigger off of... Uh, what do we got? 14 auras here. These 14 auras here. Um... Yeah, so obviously suppression field in the sideboard as well, including a split of Graft Digger's Cage and Rest in Peace, which I think is a completely, uh, perfectly fine thing to do. Um, and you'd be obviously playing this in sort of the meta game that we're in at the moment. Um, so this is the same, this is the deck I'm going to be running, sorry, uh, where I've removed two Gris Spoon and added in the two Spirit Mantles. Uh, as I sort of talked about earlier, Spirit Mantle, um, just being on that two mana will help against things like Chalice of the Void, uh, Engineered Explosives, Blast Home, um, while also providing a more powerful evasive effect and uh, also allowing your Core Spirit and Answer protection from creatures should you choose to go that way. Um, so, those decks were all sort of similar, so this is probably more important. Um, this says Glass Cannon 1 Drops. I've included two All the Glitters and Spirit Mantle into this list. Uh, I don't think it's Glass Cannon 1 Drops, that's a typo. It's more Glass Cannon Auras. Um, so the reason why it's Glass Cannon is because 
I've loaded up. I'm running uh, what twelve creatures, 20, so twenty eight auras in the deck. I don't have any removal, any protection with leyline. Um, the point where I think you'd want to run a deck like this is if you're versing like lots of control decks, because uh, control decks like to just counter your aura as they go to the graveyard. So obviously you don't need to kill your opponent's creatures or protect your hand unless it's a black control deck, but um, you don't need to do those things. So running a deck full of auras will give you very, very aggressive. Just anything you draw is gas, slam it down, attack. As it says in the title though, it is a little bit glass cannon um, and you'll lose a lot of matchups as well. But, you know... Uh, against things like Liliana, you get a chump blocker out of this cartouche. It's not all that bad. Um, you, you can have a little bit of play around with cards. Alright, so I've now ridden... Uh, I've made a deck for a Ponza Heavy meta game as well. Um, so obviously in this Ponza Heavy meta, meta game, I'm including... In my six flex sl slots, pardon me, I'm including the three Savage Swipe and the three Suppression Field. Uh, those cards are both really excellent against Ponza. I highly recommend using them. Other than that, it's just an aura suite that you've seen before and a sideboard suite you've seen before. All right, so that's going to be the end of the presentation for now. Um, those are my sample decks. I'm going to refine down a couple of sample uh, decks and a couple of sample sideboards, and I'm going to come back and uh, next week and have a sideboarding guide video, uh, and it's going to show you what to bring in and take out on the play and draw against a lot of different matchups. Um, so thank you all for watching up until the end. Um, if you're new to the channel and new to the deck, I hope you found this information uh, entertaining. Uh, if not, uh, and you're returning, I also hope you found it entertaining. If you did, uh, be sure to leave a like and comment down below, both of which are good for the YouTube algorithm. Uh, and if you want to see daily Bogles content, uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell for notifications. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.